Tonight's episode of the 31st Lap Podcast is brought to you by DirtTrackDigest.com. If it's on dirt, it's on Dirt Track Digest. This is the 31st Lap Podcast, recorded live in the studios of FingerLakes1.com in downtown Seneca Falls, New York. And now, your host, Chris Marquardt. Good afternoon and good evening and welcome to episode number 248 of the 31st Lap Podcast. Excited to have all of you along for the ride with us this evening. Exciting show lineup on deck. Dean Reynolds is going to be joining us here. It's his first appearance on the show in, I think, over a year. Uh, we've finally been able to connect and it's going to be good to have Dean back on, talk a little bit about what's happening at Dirt Car Northeast and all the other many hats that he's been wearing. A very happy new year to everyone and it is a snowy blowy very wintry day here in seneca falls uh dean as i understand it got to travel a little bit in that as he was on his way over to speedway drive in weedsport so if anybody was out on the roads today hopefully your travels were safe and if you got to go out tonight uh, also be aware of it because those temperatures are dropping uh so without uh, any more delay a very busy dean reynolds is joining us here online dean how are you I'm doing good, Chris. How you doing? We're, we're doing okay and enjoying the uh, enjoying the taste of winter. We got spoiled a little bit last week. Yeah, I think winter finally hit. You know, <laughs> it's funny. I was listening to the intro. First of all, make sure you do get the check from uh, Third Track Digest. I know how they operate. I just want to let you know on that. You want to know something funny? That was. <laughs> You know, went back when we were in the other building and we were doing the uh, the show by Bankers Light with no video element. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's the intro that's pretty much left over from there um, with the yeah. Dem- <laughs> with, with, with the D'Amico drop taken out of it. But, you know, all things come full circle. We're going to be doing a little bit of stuff with uh, Dirt Track Digest and DirtTrackDigest.tv next year. So it's good that it was left there, I suppose. You know, it's funny I said the episode, what did you say, 248? And I think I was on episode 9. Uh, 7. <laughs> or if, something if, like 7, that. I think. You, there was a, I think you shared the, the picture or the picture came up on – on the Facebook memories, it was it was inside the first ten um, when you had made the trip out here. So I mean, yeah. it's it's uh, we're inching and up we, on we that. You were you were in your thirties, and I was in my forties, correct? I am still in my thirties. I still have a few years left. Well, very good. Actually, I probably was in my forties back then because I am almost <laughs> fifty two. But <laughs> so, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll, but well, my time. how things do change. I mean, with uh, uh, some new hats have been added to to your head, and you've been able to, if I understand correctly, you've been able to separate, your, separate yourself completely and not have to worry about cell phones at all anymore. No, nope, the cell phones are, are long gone. <laughs> I do stop into the store about once a month or twice a month to see how the guys are doing the, the uh, staffing that I had there. When I left, they're still there, and they're doing good, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see that because I had a, a couple of young guys that I uh, finally got going and settled down with and and uh when i left there i said i think the store is in good hands and they're uh, they're hanging in and doing well so I'm, I'm happy to see that and you also uh hanging in and doing well you said that it was a busy 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 couple weeks here with some traveling coming up in the foreseeable future you've already got some rule books done and had to juggle a whole bunch of scheduling this year yeah, the scheduling, you know, we, we talked before we came on. I actually enjoy doing scheduling, and I think scheduling is such a vital part of hopefully the success of the seasons coming up because you want to schedule uh, with travel in mind, the teams that live in different areas in mind, uh, tracks with their regular shows and regular weekends in mind. And what you want to do is you always want to have a schedule out at the beginning of the year where more teams than not can say, I can do that. Sure. And, uh, you know, that's the key. you, you got to get them, uh, you know, hopefully on the, on the uh, right path as far as looking at the schedule, and then you follow up with that. And I think we did that this year. I spent a lot of time on all the schedules with uh, the Super Dirt Car Series Big Blocks and then the Series for 358s and Sportsman and Pro Stocks, and then also I did the scheduling for ESS as well. And uh, I think we got five good schedules. And, uh, you know, right now uh, all entities seem like they got more teams going to be following the series. I know the Big Block Series is looking real well. Uh, right now we're at 21 teams that are going to be following the series. Uh, you know, the intention of following the series at the beginning of the year, of course, uh, attrition usually figures into it. You know, it is a long year. But, um, but the crop uh, this year is probably the strongest we've had since. You know, I want to say early 2000s. That's awesome. 
I mean, we've, we've seen a, a couple of rookies declare for this year, Jack Leonard and um, Demetrius Drellos, both looking to join the Super Dirt Car Series this year. Um, the Shoot, blanked on it. The the team that Mike Mahaney is going to drive, be driving for. And Frank yeah, Cozy. Yeah, the, uh, the Adirondack uh, Auto Team. Yep, yeah. George, uh, oh, God, I forgot George's last name. I'm drawing a blank. But the Mike Ferrati old ride, yep. Right, and those, um, those, those guys are coming back. And we got back. Mike Mahaney coming back with uh, Buzz Chu. Yep. Um, and of course, uh, the first big announcement: Billy Decker coming back with Gibson. Big, yeah. That's a that's a big change right there. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that that scheduling was fun, and you said that you took care of all five schedules this year, slipping in ESS on top of the other stuff that you're you're juggling, being the director of the series and sanctioning with Dirt Car Northeast. Does that make ESS and the the Dirt Car series a a two for one option for people when you're having those conversations? We we have been a two for one before. Mm-hmm. Actually, when Mike was doing the series. Mike would um, actually call me up and ask what my schedule looked like, and there were certain tracks that would want to sure. actually book both entities because they felt that the Super Dirt Car Series and ESS was basically your best one two punch you can have. Right um, now, um, you know we only have we have uh, two shows this year that are are doubled up, but they seem to work at the tracks. But I think they're finding now that if you split up the entity, that you're going to have a successful night with the Super Dirt Car Series, and then you're going to have another good night with ESS instead of combining them. And having a real big night, they're finding that splitting them up and having two good nights uh, might be more profitable than having that one really big night. Right, you're grabbing that entertainment dollar twice instead of just once. Yes. Yeah, but the the two races that we do have combined is the uh, well now it's on July fourth this year. It's that Thursday night uh, show at Land of Legends, mm-hmm. which is uh, also a second show of the ESS Speed Week. But now it's been uh, uh, an annual deal, Land of Legends with SDS, and that seems to really work well. Right. And uh, the Labor Day double play at Weedsport has become a really good uh, one two over the years. Uh, last year, you know, we did get rained out, but we had a slew of cars. And then uh, Jenny Phelps added the Pro Stocks on that card, and that's been a really good card. Sure. Uh, but the other ones that we had, we had a few more over the years. Now we kind of uh, split them up over the last couple of years, and they seem to work uh, a little bit better for those particular tracks. Yeah, on the, on the topic of looking at the, the two-for-one <laughs> punch, um, pairing the sprint cars with other uh, regional activities with the 358s or the Pro Stocks and stuff, has that, has that come up, or, or are people mostly looking at, at least traditionally, were they looking at that um, that avenue of getting the, the, the all of it on one night or keeping it at least with the elite drivers and the elite drivers with the, the premier modified touring group and the premier 360 sprint cars, uh, that touring group? Can kind of keep them together? Well, it's interesting you say K&M has kind of uh, done that with uh, last year in September they had a big weekend, a two-race weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, where they had a Saturday night with the 358 series. Right. And it worked out really well. This year, though, we moved the sprint car race to Friday, mm-hmm. which coincides with the Sportsman series. Uh, the main reason why is because that Saturday now is the $5,000 to win show at Land of Legends that Paul Cole's doing, the New York Nationals. Mm-hmm. But Tyler Barlett at Can Am was happy to move because his Friday of the weekend was okay. Saturday was a home run, but he's thinking, you know what, they'll maybe have an ESS on Friday. Now we'll have two good nights. Right. And hopefully, which is kind of splitting up like the theory we were talking yep. earlier, that the two good nights will be more profitable for them versus the okay night and the really good night. So, uh, you know, it'll be really interesting, but it's good to see the tracks work together as well. That's a big side right there that things are going uh, in a positive direction that the tracks are willing to work with each other. If if we back it up a, a, a couple of years, maybe 10 years or so, nobody wanted to work with anybody because everybody was struggling. They were worried about themselves and, and making sure that their cars were taken care of. And, and it seems like things have stabilized a little bit. Well, in this day and age, it's, it's you know, racing's tougher. You know that. It's oh, tougher yeah. to get the, uh, no uh, kidding. the public to come to a racetrack because there's so many more options. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, as much as we love our sport and we've been in this sport forever and we, you know, I'm do- donating my whole life to the sport now, and I'm saying donating because I am getting paid. But, <laughs> um, you know, I, I made the decision, though, really to dive into it full time because I've been into it so deep for so many years. You know, I don't have a family. I don't have anybody that's going to get in the way to keep me home. 
And so I can just, you know, I'm planning on doing over 100 races this year. I'm planning on living out of a suitcase, basically. Um, you know, so I'll just have to leave the door open and somebody take care of the cat. But, <laughs> um, you know, but that's the reason why I wanted to do that. And, uh, you know, racing, there's there's only so much you can do as far as making cars go around in circles be exciting. So now tracks are realizing that with special shows and stuff like that, maybe, uh, you know, with, especially with dirt car series tracks, calling each other, working with each other. I would actually get on the phone and have two promoters on at once, um, see if we can actually pair up some shows, uh, go back to back, which we uh, did with a couple of uh, races up north where uh, before the teams would travel up north for one race and then come back three weeks later and come to the same area sure. and, you know, stuff like that. So um, you got to look at that, you know, and uh, especially with all the dirt car sanctioned tracks, you know, we always have a scheduling meeting, um, which was my first this year in November, and it was good to see the tracks talking to each other, you mm-hmm. know, uh, trying to work together and say, you know, this is what we usually run this day, but you wanted that day. It didn't really work for me, so I'm willing to move to this day. And, uh, and then after the meeting in November, then I started doing one-on-one calls with everybody, and that's how we got the schedules together. And, right. uh, you know, and I like to take my time doing schedules. Uh, we, we finalized... You know, the last three shows this week, actually, we, we got Sharon now booked before Eldora uh, for the Big Block Series, Super Dirt Car Series, and then we added a Mohawk and an Airborne 358 Series event. So our schedules are now done, but it literally took to this week to finalize them, but that's okay. In this day and age, as you know, Chris, with social media, you know, you can literally book a show in March that runs in June, and everyone's going to know about it. Right. They're going to know about it fast. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How much training went into that um, in the sense of getting the tracks on board and understanding what what you look at in terms of the creation of a schedule? Um, yeah, everybody's got their their go to dates and things along those lines, but you've you've got a lot of experience putting schedules together, and you've come to know what works in terms of grouping the shots and getting teams the ability to hit multiple shows in a single trip, not looking solely at the Central New York Speed Week program, but before that with ESS, you were doing a lot of a lot of grouping of shots. So you might have you might have thirty races on the schedule, but it might only be twenty two weekends through the course of the summer because you'll run a Friday, Saturday, or Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Was it tough getting the modified tracks on board with that that thinking and that, that line of planning? I did last year when Mike was still at the helm and I started going to races I started talking to the teams mm-hmm. and I asked them about right. traveling and what do they like you know because maybe the modified clan because it is more midweek shows mm-hmm. the ESS entity is weekend shows so it's a, sure. it's a different animal but I asked them you know what would you prefer and almost all of them said no we would like to have a back to back midweek deal because if we're going in the same area, we're only burning fuel once where we were burning fuel twice. Right. And so it, it made me have an opportunity to figure out what might work for them. And then I go to the tracks. Well, the tracks um, wasn't bad because I already know the promoters. You know, I've already known them for forever with uh, True. Sanctioning other races. <laughs> so they know that I, I like to think of different avenues. And there was a lot of times I said, no, that's not going to work, or I don't think it's going to work. And these are the reasons why, and then I look at all the other schedules of, of the other series and stuff like that, and then, uh, you know, like uh, with Airborne with Robbie Knowles, we kind of went back and forth for probably about four different dates of the 358 series race, mm-hmm. and we finally agreed on one that I thought was going to be his best date, and he kind of went on my, uh, uh, you know, my knowledge of that. Now, hopefully it does work, but, um, <laughs> right. you know, that's what I felt was the best, because he was looking at a couple different dates, and I said, well, you know, the bottom line is I will go with whatever you feel because you do know your track, but here's some of the aspects I'm afraid of. And, uh, you know, and I said no with uh, EFS shows. I've had, uh, I, I turned down four or five shows a year as well uh, just because I say it's not going to work. You know, you're not going to be happy. Yeah, I can book a show and, and uh, have a good time, but if I bring 18 sprint cars, you're not going to be happy. Right. And, uh, you know, the same thing with the uh, Super Dirt Car Series, 358 Series, and on down to sports and the pro stocks, you want to make sure that you at least bring, you know, with them, the, the magic numbers always seem to be 30 cars or more. Mm-hmm. Um, it's pro- it's getting to like that. But I think now, uh, with the purse increase on the Super Dirt Car Series and with the, hopefully a little bit uh, more thought into the scheduling and, and with the tracks working with each other, I think, uh, I think you're going to see a rise in the car counts, which is... Uh, 
you know, a term you don't hear a lot these days, but hopefully we, we can say that. The uh, You hit on a bunch of different things. Um, the one that jumped right off uh, immediately was where you said that the expectation nowadays is, is about 30 cars, which, which I think is fair. You know, you dial things back a couple of years, and you were happy if you were getting 24 to 28 sprint cars at a, at a particular show. Um, with the depth of the sportsman ranks now, does that 30 number still hold, or do tracks expect more sportsman cars to show up for a tour series race? Because if you look at the rap sheets from the weekend, some of these tracks are running two and three different features for their sportsman divisions. Yeah, the sportsman is a funny uh, avenue as far as scheduling because a lot of the races are on weekends mm -hmm. because you have your, um, you know, you have your, uh, uh, oh, God, why am I drawing a blank? Chris, don't get old, you forget crap. Okay. Um, <laughs> you have your regions. Right. And, uh, you know, sportsman, we have the western, the northern, and the central regions. Mm-hmm. So there could be, at times, actually, there's competing regions booking races on the same date. Right, on, the, on top but of each other. With, yeah, with sportsmen, though, because of the sheer numbers, 30 is probably a low number for them. I was looking at the car counts last year. Most races were mid-30s into the 40 range. And then when we got at the end of the year where we ran, uh, you know, the regions were shut down, you run the combined deal, then you're looking into the 50s. Right. Um, you know, and it's just because there's just so many sportsman cars out there. Sure. But I, I looked at that and I tried to uh, clean that up a little bit. Uh -huh. um, you know, where even though a driver might be running the North Region and getting points in the North Region, there still might be a race um, on a Wednesday at a track that he can go to just because the purse is a thousand win and just wants to run it. Sure. You know, and I, and I looked at that. Um, there's uh, other entities like Canadegua has a. Uh, Sportsman Series race on June 29th on a Saturday. Well, the reason why we put that together is because Fulton's going to shut down for graduation weekend. Right. So we can run a Central Series race there because there's no Central tracks running on Saturday night. k and is a Friday night track. Brewerton's a Friday night track. Fulton, a Saturday night track, is going to be shut down, and Utica Rome's being a Sunday night track. Mm -hmm. So Land of Legends decided to run a Series race on that date. And, you know, there's, so there's a lot of things that you think of as far as going on. Now, um, Cornwall, a good, uh, a good uh, aspect they're talking about is Cornwall runs their uh, 358 series race on July 14th. Now, everyone's like, why July 14th is such a different date? Well, the reason why is because the All-Stars are in central New York and Utica Rome's running an All-Star race on Friday. Mm -hmm. They're shutting down on Sunday. So now Cornwall can run a 358 series race on a Sunday, which is their normal night, and, and not that, conflict with any 358 tracks. Right, it doesn't hurt anybody. Yeah, so there's a lot of that that has to go in. And, uh, you know, and I'll have all the track schedules up. I'll, you know, even if the schedules aren't up, I'll call the promoter. And, you know, and like uh, at that time, I uh, got a hold of Bill and Kim Shea, and I said, mm -hmm. I know they shut down a couple Sundays. Yep. And I said, you know, what Sundays do you shut down? And they, they told me which ones. And I said, okay, do you mind if I go to Cornwall and book a 358 series race on one of those dates? So I'm going to offer them. And they said, no, absolutely not. And, uh, and the same thing, Utica Roman Return books their 358 series race on Sunday, but they book it early in May where Cornwall's not open yet. Right. So it works out well there. <laughs> so you there's so many different aspects you got to look at when it comes to scheduling. Is it perfect? No, scheduling's never going to be perfect. No. Because um, it's just so many tracks around, you know. But that's what it takes to, to put into a, a schedule. And, and you know, and I, I'm i even looking at the schedules now, and I'm looking already thinking of next year. You know, what right. can I do next year? <laughs> right. But, you know, you, you, you got to analyze this year first before you totally can go into next year. Sure. You know, but, but my head's always churning one way or another. If it's not about the... Vikings or the Yankees or Syracuse Crunch or something, my head's always turning. <laughs> you, you, it, it's funny that you said uh, Utica Rome, they, they shut down periodically, you know, through the course of the summer. It seemed like they were shut down four out of five Sundays if you looked at any given patch of time with the weather they got last year. Oh, God, I feel so bad for that. It was rough, I mean, man. They, you know, it just, you know, Bill, uh, well, sitting there with Bill, um, you know, this is going to be his fourth year at the helm, and he, he keeps on holding out hope. He goes, well, it can't rain every year, can it? <laughs> and I'm like, God, I mean, you know, it's just, you know, when you're talking 11 rainouts one year, eight rainouts the next, and I think nine the other, I mean, my God, you know, how can you even 
think you're going to get that many. And then last year, you know, I remember talking to Mallet because Mallet does the announcing and John mm-hmm. Tiff is a good friend of mine and stuff. And they go, yeah, the sun's out, but it's 98 degrees. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and no one's going to come out in that weather either. Right. You know, so, well. I mean, it, it's just, you know, this racetrack business is, is tough. And I kind of get defensive when people get on social media and get on, uh, you know, message boards and stuff like that. And they put up a comment and everything. And I go, you know, it's just, uh, you know, this, this deal is tough. I mean, you know, we're lucky that we got these people trying to keep these tracks open because, you know, there's, there's tracks that we just don't know, you know, each year if they're going to open or not. And, right. and uh, you know, you're going to keep on seeing tracks more and more. You're going to see tracks shut down. I mean, you're not going to see tracks built anymore. I mean, that, that day and age is about done. Right. Um, so you got to keep the ones that are open now and hopefully have an owner that has pockets enough, uh, you know, they can keep on putting improvements in the track and maybe, uh, you know, when you talk to a lot of these track owners, they always say they don't want to make money, but they just don't want to lose money. Right. <laughs> right. You know, but they want to have a hobby you know, that'll pay for itself. Yeah. I mean, but you look at business one one. that's not how you want to run a business, but it's getting to that point where, you know, that, that's what kind of racing is kind of getting to it. It's, uh, you know, you hope to do well in your special shows and hope not to lose so much in your regular shows. Racing you know? business isn't, it isn't business as much, I think, as it's a culture. And the culture has come to accept that for so long that it was, it was individuals with, with deep pockets and investments other places that the track just had to keep itself afloat. The mission was to just yeah. keep the track afloat. There was people out there that were making money. Don't get me wrong. There was, there was individuals that were out there that were making very good money off of their racetracks, but there isn't any type of profit sharing thing in place that the tracks that were struggling mightily, were going to get a slice of that. That money stayed with that track and that track improved and that track got better, better and that track got more attention. And, and that's how it, that's how it went. But that mid range in the center of that bell curve, the culture was, we just need to keep going. And, and that's now yeah. the, the business model then was we just need to keep going. And that has morphed into a culture. I mean, you look at race teams now. There's race teams that run with that, that theory. And you're right. It's not how a business is supposed to run. But if, if that's what you are surrounded by, eventually you're going to adopt it. You know, there's probably, well, how many tracks here in the Northeast? And even in New York and Canada alone, I mean, between asphalt and dirt, you're probably talking about 30 racetracks, I would right. think, or close to it. There is only one track, one track, where the owner of the track is making his living off that track. How about that? I'm, I'm not going to say because I don't know if he really wants to let that <laughs> known, but, you know. right. but, but that's it. There's one track. One. What's that tell you? It, it, it is not a no. profitable business. <laughs> no. So, you know, we're very thankful that we got these people that do have these tracks. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just... Uh, you know, that's, that's what it's come to. And I mean, and it, it's not, you know, a lot of people say what's wrong with the sport. There's actually, believe it or not, there's nothing wrong with the sport. The racing's as exciting as ever. And it's just what I alluded to earlier. There's just so many different things to do now than watch cars go around in circles. And there's only so much we can do with these cars to go around in circles to make it exciting for the new generation. I mean, I can remember when the first Bigfoot video came out and Bigfoot crushed that one car. Right. And Bigfoot came up into the trunk of that car and then hit the gas and landed on the trunk. The fans went nuts. <laughs> and then hit the gas a little bit and kind of crawled onto the roof and stopped. The fans went nuts. Now, if Bigfoot doesn't do 14 flips in this uh, freestyle and does a front flip, a back flip, the body flies off, the thing blows up, burns to the ground, fans think it's boring. Right. <laughs> what can we do to our auto racing that's going to make it that exciting for people to want to do, you know, come to the races? So that's where you got to think outside the box and do a demo derby on your night or do a, yes. you know, or bring in a monster truck on your regular night or, or something. That's what, I mean, I, you know, I left a cell phone store where my employees couldn't wait to get home to play Fortnite for five hours. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't even know what the hell Fortnite was. And then when they showed me, I'm like, really? This is what you want to do? Welcome to the generation. You right. know? I mean, it's just... So that's what they want to... They don't even want to leave the house. <laughs> you know? They, they want to go home behind a 55-inch screen TV, get on the internet, and blow up different people from California, to Japan, to Canada, to 
to next door. <laughs> the uh, there's it almost seems like another thing that that, that, that seems to be affecting uh, motorsports, both on the positive and the negative side, is is as you alluded to the message boards and social media that basically if you have a login, you have an opinion that matters. And people are very, very quick to come down on somebody, but they're not nearly as quick to throw around the compliments. And, and that's a little bit pandemic in in, yeah. in the yeah. dirt track side of things. I don't know how bad it is in asphalt, but I got to believe that motorsports, motorsports. Well, you, you, you almost got to look. It's almost like that in life. You always yeah. remember the bad, but you don't remember the good. Right. You know? You always, even when you you play poker or something like that, you remember that bad beat you got when he, when he or she wound up getting those two eights on the, on the turn in the river to beat you with a three of a kind. But you don't remember that one time you got the straight on the turn in the river and you won that pot two hours ago. Right. <laughs> you remember how you how you lost, but you don't remember you got lucky on a hand two hours ago. Sure. And it's kind of the same thing with you know sports. You know, it's not just racing, it's baseball, it's football. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, there's people who get on, you know, uh, if they're a Cowboy fan and the the ref made a bad call, that's all they're going to remember. We lost because of the ref, but yet they don't remember how they got those two fumbles in the first quarter and got lucky and got two touchdowns off that. Right. You know. You know, the parody, it's just, you know. The parody that we have now is, is pretty good. Um I don't know if it's I don't know if it's the same as what it was in the 70s and 80s. Um, I think there was a bigger gap between the haves and the have-nots then. Uh, but then you can easily make that argument with the, the innovation of the sport and the direction that everything has gone and as much custom-built stuff as there is now that the separation between the haves and the have-nots is greater now than it was then. Um, the sportsman side of things is probably more competitive. And, and, of course, you've got the generational thing where the battles between um, – you know, Jack Johnson and Dave Lape back 20, 30 years ago aren't going to be anywhere as close to the battles that we've seen between uh, Matt Shepard and, and Mike Mahaney and Stu Friesen. So you've got that generational thing. And then I'll, I mean, I remember when, when, when the, the hot race to watch was Tim McCready and Tim Fuller and Gary Tompkins and, and Alan Johnson. A lot of those names are still the people that are in front. And those names that I was talking about then were the ones that were winning 10 years before that. So our our uh, faces on top are, are just, I don't know if it's just is, is fair to say, but I'm, I'm going to go with it, are, are just starting to really make those major changes because we've still seen all those names that were winning in the late 90s, mid-90s, late 90s. We're still winning races right up until, I mean, last year. It's, it's you know, it's funny. We were talking about that um, actually over, the, you know, a couple months ago. I was talking about that with a bunch of friends. And it's kind of unique that you you got to sit back and wonder how good these drivers are. Right. You got <laughs> how many guys are over fifty? I mean, you, even over sixty. You got Brett Hearns over sixty. Pat Ward's over sixty. Then you got Danny. Then you got Allen. Then you got Tremont. Then you got Billy Decker. Then you got Timmy Fuller. And all these people are over fifty years old. Now we know Stewart and Matt are on top of the game right now, and they are the big two, and the ones that everyone talks about. And then you got Jimmy and you know and Max, and then Eric Rudolph now has really come on. But when you look at these guys still winning at their age, I mean, I'm fifty two, and I'm hoping to get off the couch in the morning. <laughs> and these guys are still wheeling a modified, going around these dirt tracks and beating guys half or one-third their age. Right. <laughs> and it's amazing. So I, I sat there in the, comp- you know, in, a, in the topic of conversation, and they go, you know, we talk about Kinzer, we talk about Wolfgang and Swindell with the Outlaws and all this and all that. And I go, but you know what? In a, in a, in a way, are we seeing some of the best drivers in the history of this sport. And everyone goes, yeah, but you know, they never went to NASCAR. And besides that, I mean, it's just, that's the way it worked. Right. But are these guys that good? I mean, it's amazing. Because why well, as I check running these modified, they ain't easy to do. <laughs> you know? That's so sure. it, it's still unique. You know, I mean, you know, Danny Johnson was third in points on the, school, on the, on the Super Dirt Car Series coming into Charlotte, and then, and then he had a little bit of bad luck and wound up dropping a couple spots. But third in points, mm-hmm. you know, I, I mean, to me that's amazing. You know, third in points are two wins. Right. And, and you know, successful successful year. Not like not like there was six cars following the series and he happened to make half of them. He had to be competitive in order to get third place. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, he ran ran the entire series and with two teams. You know, because when he <laughs> about destroyed that. George's uh, Shackleton's car at Orange County, uh, you know, luckily Ray Graham came aboard and helped him out. And uh, but you, you know, Danny Johnson, I mean, he, you know, whether it's a toy or a big nail, a teal or a wheelbarrow, <laughs> right. you know, I mean, it's just you know, he's going to make it go, you know, for sure. And and all these guys are like that. I mean, it's just it's amazing that you know how good they are, and then you know now. With the announcement today, it's funny how we talk about that with Max moving on to the K and N series. You know, I'm interested to see that because I don't know why the drivers from this era and this area do not move on. It's kind of kind of weird. I don't know why. Is it because our modifieds are just germane to this area and no one looks at them? You know, I, I do know that Brett tried, Jimmy Horton tried, Ty Scott back in the day, Charlie Rudolph tried. You know, to do what was called Grand National at Winston Cup back in the day, but. Right. Um, you know, but you got to think that they were good enough to do it because now you're watching Stuart Friesen and what he's doing. Sure. You know? And, uh, you know, do I think Stuart Friesen can run Monster Cup? <laughs> Hell yeah. He's probably better than two thirds of that field, to be honest. True. Right. Um, and I hope he does get the opportunity to do it. I, I'm, I'm watching him buck the trend. You know, mm-hmm. it's not a 18 year old kid coming up with daddy's got $7 million to dump into the team and we're going to throw him behind the wheel and see how he does. <laughs> you know, you know, the Hallmark, of course, has money. Yes, uh, you know, and luckily he's got that. But you know, Stewart's doing it on talent. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, and it, that's the way it should be. Because I remember talking to, you know, Timmy McCready when he was doing what was it, Childress? I think he was Childress. Doing? Yeah, he was on the development deal with Childress. Yeah, and I remember talking to him after. Uh, matter of fact, it was the car show in March, and I asked him, you know, what happened, and he goes. He basically came up to me and says, I got to bring in so and so dollar amount for a sponsor or else I don't have the ride. And that's what happened. You know, he goes, It's not about the talent part. Uh, but I'm glad to see Stuart bucking that trend. I really yeah. am. Um, we were talking earlier about when the races fall. And I was surprised when you were talking about the touring guys, uh, the, the modified side of things, saying they prefer double headers during the week versus running on the weekends. And, and I get that the home track points are important. They want to make sure that they're going to be able to um, score all those and run on their weekly tracks. What I was surprised, though, is, is a couple of years ago, there was a very focused push to get more of those tour races on the weekends, mirroring more of what was done on the World of Outlaw side of things. Um, has that push gone back to the way that it was um, to simplify it? And, and run with the tour events during the, the midweek schedule and stay away from the weekends and not affect the and, and overlap on the home tracks? I think it's, well, it's kind of come twofold. Um, <laughs> I actually think the midweek shows, and especially with the weekend shows that we had last year, the midweek shows actually draw bigger crowds. Yeah. Um, you know, where it, you know, at, I think the the theory was, and I wasn't in on the scheduling last year, but, you know, you know Wheatsport had a Saturday race and, and Brewerton had a Friday race, and they both um, said that we're not doing that because it didn't bring in the crowd. And I think it came into where people were going to go to their regular tracks. They're not going to travel three hours to see a series race. They're still going to go 10 to 15 to 20 miles down the road and go to the regular track. And even though they're missing – four or five of their stars at the regular track, they still rather be at the regular track. Right. Um, so I think crowd wise, I think it has gone back to where the midweek shows are more successful. Um, we're going to try a couple midweek shows of the three fifty eights this year. We got four of them on the midweek where I think last year there was none, um, you know, with that type of theory. Mm-hmm. So I think it's kind of gone back to that. So where uh, you know, there's only two Saturday night races on the super dirt car series this year. Uh, on the weekends, and, uh, you know, we're going to see how they, they work, and I kind of want to get back to the midweeks if we can. Mm-hmm. Um, a, because I, I just think it keeps the, you know, the Saturday, the, uh, the modified tracks uh, healthy for the regular shows, and, and B, I, I literally do think it just brings more car, more people in the, in the stands on the midweek. I really do. Well, isn't there also something to be said that if, if you have a Super Dirt Car Series race at uh, Brewerton on a Friday – Taking nothing away from anybody, but is that as special as having a Super Dirt Car Series race at Brewerton on a Tuesday or having a Super Dirt Car Series race at, at Land of Legends on a Saturday versus having it on a, a Wednesday or a Thursday? Theoretically, 
whether you have that Super Dirt Car Series banner out there or not, and whether it's 100 laps or 35 laps, I think the fans are also considering the fact that they're going to see those guys one way or the other on a Friday. It's not special anymore. But when you put it on an off night and you know for sure that there's other people that are coming from out of town, there's it, it, it exactly. becomes a draw. It's yeah. It becomes special. Yeah. And, and and I think it, it also comes to where the fans can still enjoy the races at the regular track. And then if the race is, like, say, within two hours, um, mm-hmm. you know, and they get home from work and everything, and, and it's a nice day, and they say, you know what, they live in, the, say, Utica, Rome area, and the Super Dirt Car Series is at Land of Legends on a Thursday. You know what, they're going to drive out there and go see it. Right. They can make it. You know, where if it's on a Saturday and, say, their weekly track is Canny, I'm on, well, Canny, I'm Fulton, even though Land of Legends is only an hour away, they're going to say, you know what, I'm still going to go to Fulton. And I think that's what kind of developed last year in a way. Uh, but you're right, though. When it's on a midweek, there's also an opportunity of seeing, uh, you know, guys that maybe are not platinum drivers. Right. But they're coming out because the purse is good, and, and uh, you know, they're going to leave, uh, you know, say uh, Billy Pouch Jr. might come up, you mm-hmm. know. Um, you might get Ryan Watt coming up or, or Ricky Lawbach. You know, mm-hmm. he might be there. Where if it's a weekend show, they're not going to be there. They're not. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> no, no. How did it come to pass that you're able to get a bunch of these races to pay ten grand to win? Well, you know, it's ten grand is like a magical number. Yes, it is. And it seems it to is, draw fans. You it know, is a it mystical seems to thing. Give it some spark. And plus, knowing that there's a guaranteed starting status for Oswego. Um, mm-hmm. So there's really a good perk there as well. And, you know, it, it's marketable. I mean, the, the Super Dirt Car Series is marketable no matter what. Now, uh, with all events, at least 7,500 to win, uh, I think that's uh, where you're seeing, uh, you know, more teams that plan on following the series is coming about. But, you know, something about a race that pays five digits to win. And, and a lot of tracks are strategically. Doing that to think uh, where it might be a home run, like KM is now kicking off the series, mm-hmm. and Tyler says, "You know what? Let's go with the ten thousand. Let's let's make this an event. Sure. Um, you know, not that the Super Dirt Car Series is not an event, but let's make this an event. And uh, you know, for a track like KM, that ten thousand a win is going to mean a lot more as far as marketing and fans and competitors than it will be for Burton. Right." You know, because Burton doesn't, you know, 10,000 to win is not really going to make a bigger punch at an established big block track as it would for a track that's a 358 regular track that's bringing back the, the, dirt, the you know, the Super Dirt Car Series after, you know, what, six, seven, eight year absence. Right. And, uh, and then uh, there's other tracks like Airborne and Mohawk. You know, they're kind of off the beaten path a little bit. You know, they're out of the nucleus of Central New York, away from the big block tracks, but you know what? 10,000 to win is going to bring extra big blocks to that event because the purse alone is going to bring more stars, which is going to bring more fans. It's going to bring more notoriety to track. And hopefully it's just a snowball that will get bigger and bigger. Well, it wasn't 10 grand to win is pretty much the standard for the world of outlaw stuff, either side, sprint car or late model, if I understand it right. Yes. It, yeah. it, it, and, and years ago when, when world racing group came in, the discussion was that we were going to put the modifieds, up there as equals with World of Outlaws, Spring Cars, and Late Models, and and, and eventually this is going to happen. We're going to be paying this ten thousand to win, and it's taken a while. It's taken a while to get there because it, it's 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 a big it's a big change, but it's it's finally come to pass where we're starting to see some of that return. And and I'm a I'm a huge fan of it. I think it, I think it's great. I think it's going to work out the way that it's supposed to. And the other thing that I liked is it wasn't that we just restructured it. So it's now it's now it's ten thousand to win, two hundred for a second, and and a hundred dollars back through tenth and fifty bucks the rest of the way. It's a healthy purse. It's not just a restructuring of of the old purse from two thousand five. No, the um, the purse structure, even with the the seventy five hundred dollar to win purses, the purse went up for first place, and then it went up from sixth place on back. Right. Um, the numbers were good from second through fifth. They were very good. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I like the way that purse was set up. Mm-hmm. Um, the the six thousand a win has been a staple since you know you were what eight. You know, I mean, it's just <laughs> right. uh, you know, I mean, it, it's been, it's been like that forever. And uh, you know, it, when you do raise the to win, it gives the show some spark. It gives it some flair. 
Um, so we added a little bit there. But then now this day and age, we're back in the 90s. The two win meant everything. I mean, no one even asked what second paid for back in those days. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and that's where you did see those purses, 10000 to win, and second was, you know, second was 2000 third was thanks for coming. Right. You know, I mean, it was just, there was a lot of that back in the days. Mm. But now a lot of them look at the to start. And I always felt when doing purses, the, the big numbers are to win, tenth, and to start. And then you massage the numbers in between. And that's what we did with the Super Dirt Curse Series. So we got you to win, which is either 7,500 or 10,000. We got tenth at 1,000, and we got you to start at 500 bucks. And those are really good numbers. Yep. And I got teams that I've been talking to that aren't following the series or anything like that, but say a team that ran Land of Legends regularly, why didn't they go out to Ransomville for the Super Dirt Car Series race? It's not that far away. Mm-hmm. Well, that 300 to start didn't seem like, well, you know, there's going to be some stars there, 300 to start, eh, I'll stay home. Now I had a couple teams say, you know what, I'm going to go to Ransomville because it's 500 to start. We might not make it, but you know what, that's part of racing. Right. But if I do make it, I'm getting 500 bucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that's hopefully what the purse increase will do. Better be, or else my job will—you know—I'll be, you know, slapping phones next year. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, yeah, but uh, I, I think it's going to work. We're, we're going real heavy with the marketing and PR for the tracks as well. Right. Uh, me and Joe Grabanowski have a, a plan for each track, and we're going to help them out with the resources that we have and we're going very aggressive with uh tv spots for them and advertising spots and stuff for them for each track that books an sds and books a 358 series race on down to the pro stock so um you know we've beefed up our resources as well so uh, we're going to try to do as much as we can to you know make it the tracks worthwhile with the extra investment that they all agreed to do and hopefully when we get done they're going to say hey it's work thank you and and let's keep on building, you know, and, and that's the goal. Uh, years ago, and I don't even remember when this was. I, I don't. It was at, it was at Black Rock, way back at Black Rock, and and Mike Mallet was there, and it was a sprint car race, and we were standing out, and and I made some joke about you being a sprint car guy, and and you quickly corrected me and, and explained to me about writing for Area Auto Racing News and and having been around modifieds and coming up as a modified guy. What does this position and the conversation that we've had tonight and the work that you've got to go, go do tomorrow and, and the changes that you've been able to implement already uh, mean to you? You know, have you, is, has this been a dream job? Has there been a couple stop and pinch me as this real moments? Has this just been, eh, I'm 52 years old. I've done a lot of stuff. This thing was bound to come to me eventually. Where, where, where is Dean Reynolds at and all this? Dean Reynolds, the race fan. I, you know, it's funny when you say pinch. I, I don't know if it's that's the the feeling. I do, you know, I'm not a religious guy by any means, but, you know, you hear the, the wording, I feel blessed. And, you know, there's very few people that their full-time jobs is to work auto racing here in the Northeast Canada or whatever, and I'm one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think I, I like to think I've earned it with the hard work I've done in the racing over the years, but I don't take that for granted because now that I look like, uh, you know, uh, not look like now that I know somebody is willing to put an investment in me to see what I can do, I'm putting so much pressure on myself now to see what I can do to help out. Um, the wheel's been invented. Racing's been around forever. <laughs> right. Sometimes you need to put some new rubber on the wheel. Sure. And that's kind of been what my theory is. And I have some theories. And, and you know, the, the Super Dirt Car Series has been a, a fabulous series since Jill Scott Nicky had it. And then with Mike Parati's great job that he did. And he's built up the series in a lot of aspects that it's so strong. I don't have to worry about Then I can maybe move towards where I think I might know uh, where my strengths are as far as marketing and PR and scheduling and stuff like that. Hopefully to help out. Uh, you know, it, it's it's just... It is fun. I mean, it, it is. It, it's lit a spark underneath me. Mm-hmm. Um, I enjoyed my cell phone job, but there was a couple times where I wake up in the morning and I was like, ah, I got to go to that store and, and stuff like that and everything else. But you know, I got out of that. Sometimes you get in a rut. But now with the, with racing, 
Um, you know, my phone will go off at, uh, at 11 o'clock at night sometimes, and somebody's asking a question. But you know what? I answer it. Most, you know, most times I answer the phone when I can, but a lot of times I don't because I'm already on the phone. Um, <laughs> but, you know, because it, it, it does happen quite a bit, and I apologize when I call the people back three hours later. Um, but it, it, it's just, you know, I have sat awake at night just thinking about it. And, and the main reason is I, I just want to help racing. You know, because mm-hmm. like you said, though, a lot of it is I'm 52 years old with no family, no kids. I don't even own a house. You know, I rent. And I'm like, you know, how many people around can really have a situation like that? Right. That can put the time that the sport needs. I I never considered myself better than anybody, and quite frankly, at all. But you know what? I'm willing to work and work harder than most, hopefully. Uh, and hopefully that produces results. Hopefully I make better decisions more than mistakes. Right. You know, um, you know there was one That's promoter that says, hey, you know what, though? I've learned from 30 years of mistakes. Mm-hmm. And I started thinking about that, and I'm like, wow, that's that's a good way of looking at it. Over the 30 years, you learn what not to do. Sure. And, uh, and you know, and I started, and I go, God, those are, those are words. And I know I'm jumping around a lot because I still... You know, it's only been September, and, uh, you know, it's been busy because, you know, as soon as I, you know, got hired three weeks later, I'm at Super Dirt Week, and then uh, I'm down in Charlotte, and then was the dirt car meetings, and then the scheduling, and then PRI, and now I'm getting, uh, you know, the rule book I got done with with help of Mark Hitchcock and all that, and now we're getting ready for Dirt Car Nationals, and, you know, it's uh, it's a busy time, but yet it's, it's been fun, you know, I just, I enjoy it, uh, and, and hopefully, uh you know, the changes I, you know, subtly make, because like I said, there's not a lot that needs to be changed, but there's a couple things that need to be maybe tweaked or done a little bit different. Hopefully, it, you know, if I find what those areas are after this year or two, because I still really need to get a year under my belt, right. um, you know, hopefully I can make some that will help this sport. Um, and it's funny when you said I'm a modified guy, I always have been, um, I love the ESS when I saw them come to my modified track. Mm-hmm. And when ESS didn't have a PR director back in, in 1992, and I noticed they weren't getting any PR out, I was like, you know, I really enjoy racing with the ESS. I like enjoy when they come to my modified track. Maybe this is my next in to get into racing. Yep. And that's basically how I went to ESS. Right. Is because I thought it was just a way for me to get into racing besides just writing for Auto Racing News back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, but modifieds needs to be strong in the Northeast. If if modifieds aren't strong in the Northeast, then racing's in trouble. True. And uh, and there's a lot of good people in this sport that's hoping that modifieds will continue to stay at least at the level they are. But you know, I'm hoping to maybe see if we can see make these modifieds grow. And and we got a lot of thought and a lot of theories going on that. Hopefully we can implement over the years and and see what can happen. You know, because uh, you know the Northeast is such a unique area with these modifieds. I mean, other than I don't even know, you know, Australia. I guess Chris, where else do these cars I, race? Uh, you know, these, these are our cars. The Northeast and then uh, parts of Canada and like you said, down in Australia. That's that's about it. You don't see them anyplace else. And you know, in in my travels around the country, we've we talked about we we have dirt modifieds up there oh yeah yeah yeah. i, I know what those are it's like no you don't <laughs> you you don't we have <laughs> you know, we have we have your modifieds up there too and your modifieds aren't anything like our modifieds yeah now now when you when you get outside of ohio when you say the word modified you're it's looking MCAs. at the car that kenny schrader and david stremmy and kenny yeah. walls run yeah imcas late models with no modified. fenders yeah wh- yep. whatever it's it E so, mod B mod whatever you call it. It's all it's all loosely the same thing. I M C A A yeah, UMP yeah, style. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's fact. that's what modifieds are, and, and that's where I think uh, the success of Stuart Friesen with the trucks has meant so much to us. Mm-hmm. Because Stuart always mentions you know the modified heritage here in the Northeast. You know when he yep. does his interviews, he always tries to bring up the modifieds, which is which is awesome because then you know it's funny I was just talking to people today. Now I bet you when people go down to, uh, say, uh, down to Charlotte for the World Finals, there might be might be somebody say, oh, that's those cars that Stuart Friesen runs. Right. <laughs> you know, and if five people think of that, that helps the sport. It helps our sport. Definitely. You know? Definitely. It does. You know, it, it's just same thing with Volusia. You know, hopefully uh, same way. You know, 
uh, you know, when, and Stewart's going to run four to five nights, and you know, it's that's how it helps. That's how it helps our sport, and then uh, you know, hopefully, uh, he can continue the success up there. You've got EMPA coming, uh, EMPA coming up, and then after that, you've got Motorsports Expo and Oaks PA, and then you're bound for Florida, right? Yeah, I got one weekend off in between, and then I go to Florida. <laughs> so, and I go to Florida for uh, uh, actually three weekends down there. Yeah. And then I come back, and then uh, got three weekends after that's the motorsports show here in Syracuse. Right. Uh, and then uh, the first Super Dirt Car Series is a month after that at uh, Can Am. There's no such thing as an off season. No, no, there isn't. Yeah, you know, it's uh, you know it's funny. Uh, I got all my friends getting to leave uh, this this weekend to go to the Chili Bowl, and uh, you know I went there last year. And I, I bowed out of the group that I went with last year, and they said, why? And I said, well, it's because I wanted to take my vacation this year and do a little something different and go to Florida. <laughs> so, well, now it looks like I'll be going to Chili Bowl every year after this. Right. <laughs> so, you know, so it's kind of kind of funny how that worked out. But, you know, I was, I was thinking about going to Florida, maybe uh, you know, meet up with Mike Mallett and uh, do a couple races down there and everything. But now i got to go for, uh, you know, I think it's uh, – be down there for 14, 15 days or something like that now. Won't be the worst. No, I can think of different things, especially after a day like today. Right, yeah, <laughs> so, makes you think about it. Yeah. Um, earlier you mentioned that you'll be doing over 100 races this year likely. When was the last time you did over 100 races in a year? That's a good question. Um, remember when they used to have the Super Fan Contest? Back, I do. Back in the 80s? Yeah. Well, you know what's funny? 1991... I went to 140 races, God. and I was third in the country back then. Right. And uh, there was a person out of California who went to 162, and then there was another person in Wisconsin that went to 141, and I had 140. Wow. And it was when I did that, that was kind of like, you know, that was, I think the year after that I did over 100, but then after after that I slowed down, uh, you know, because then I started with ESS in 92, so... Right. Um, you know, I kind of slowed down after that and, and I kind of slowed down a little bit because I didn't want to get burned out of the sport either. Cause you can do that, you know? And, and, uh, so it was kind of more of my choice to slow down, but this year now, um, you know, you don't have the, the clock in clock out job per se. So, uh, you know, I want to make it to as many series races as I can from all the way down to pro stocks on up to SDS. I want to, you know, I made a pledge during the, uh, dirt car meetings. That I will visit every single dirt car sanctioned track. And I meant that. So if there's a uh, Friday that, you know, it's open and I haven't gotten to Lernerville yet, you know what, I'm going to get in the car and drive to Lernerville. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, I want to I wanna be there. And uh, so I looked at the, you know, looked at all the series races and then look at the weekends. And then, you know, of course, I am going to still do some of the ESS shows as well. I, I figure I'll be over 100 races this year. That's cool. <laughs> um, we, we talked a little bit about the, the modified background and, and your love of sprint cars. You've got a sprint car as your uh, Facebook wallpaper, and it's a 22Z, and Reynolds is across the wicker bill. What's what's the story behind that photo? I actually ran a 305 race at I-88, mm-hmm. which was Afton back then. Um, I've, I've raced go-karts and street stocks a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so I have raced. And um, I actually practiced with Doug Emery's 360 sprint car at what is now Freedom Raceway back when Mike Lauterborn had it, I think it was called, God, I don't even know what he called it back then, kind of drawing a blank, but, you know, he had that track back then, and Doug Emery's dad Man, actually Mike had a Lauterborn. dream of running a... What's that? <laughs> Mike Lauterborn. I haven't, I haven't thought about that name in forever. I forgot he had a track. Oh, geez, yeah. yeah. So, but he, um, Doug Emery's dad at the time uh, wanted to drive a sprint car. Mm. Um, you know, just one last time to drive a sprint car. So they actually rented the track out for a day. Mm-hmm. And Doug Emery, who's, who's one of my good friends in racing, just calls me up out of the blue and he says, what are you doing on this date? And I said, nothing, why? And he says, well, we're going to pick you up. And I said, okay. Uh, do you need me to bring beer or anything like that or whatever? He said, no, no, no beer or anything like that. So um, he picks me up and there he is in the motorhome with the sprint car trailer behind. And I go, what race are we going to? He goes, no, you'll see. And he actually didn't really even tell me. And then, lo and behold, we come to, uh, you know, which I'll call Freedom, because it might have been called Freedom back then, I wasn't sure, right. um, or South Arcade or what, something like that. And then it's a Sunday. And he goes, yeah, we rented out the track, and I want you to drive my sprint car, because I've 
you know, always said that I want to get behind the wheel of the sprint car because I've been with the SS for so long. Mm -hmm. Well, I got behind the wheel of the sprint car and, and, you know, he said, do what you want. So I, you know, I opened it up and went around the track and, you know, and again, I've raced before, but not like anything like this. But when he got done, he goes, uh, you're fine as far as running a race. And I'm like, what? And he goes, no, you're, you're doing your times and whatever. <laughs> so I started thinking, you know, I was good friends with Mark Zenzik, who owned the, the 22Z. Mm -hmm. And I came up to Mark, and I said, you know what? Uh, would you be willing to rent out your car? And he says, yeah, what do you have in mind? And I said, well, I want to run it, you know, uh, you know, for a race. And so what I did is I rented out the car for the price of what the CRSA at that time was paying to win. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, you know, it got to, uh, so I gave him that amount of money uh, to rent out the ride. And then I tell you what, I, I felt like I was Jeff Gordon. That was a helmet in hand. Uh, Doug Emery came down to help crew. Mark was crewing on it. They wound up buying a new right rear for me. <laughs> and I ran a 305 CRSA sanctioned race at Aston in the, back in the day. And, uh, you know, I had three goals. One, to have fun. Well, of course, you couldn't wipe the smile off my face. Right. <laughs> me. Be to pass a car legitimately, which I did. You know, I passed actually a couple. And C, not to wreck the darn thing. <laughs> um, and I actually finished the race. Uh, you know, I got left uh, right at the end. As a matter of fact, I'm in the victory lane shot. <laughs> you know, with, uh, uh, Jamie Christian won the race, but if you look, I'm on, the, I'm on the inside of the track, and you see the nose of an orange sprint car. So I saw the flashes go off, so I knew I was in the shot. And, uh, but I finished the race. I started 21st, finished 18th. And uh, so I ran a, ran the 305. And, and then still, in all this day, that's my most fun day I've ever had in racing. I still think about Mark, and I bring it up. And, you know, my dad was there, which was really big, to have him watch me. And I got it on video and, and got a lot of photos and all. So it was great. And then, ironically, about two years later, I was actually slated to run Doug's car in the EFS show. Mm-hmm. Problem was, is that was the summer I got my pacemaker put in. <laughs> so, and I, I got my pacemaker put in in July, and I wasn't in the, the race at the end of August, and the doctors wouldn't clear me uh, to go racing. So I had to give up my ride to Stuart Friesen. Of course, he promptly put a race in Victory Lane, which I sure the hell wouldn't have done that. <laughs> but, you know, so, uh, but the cool thing was, he, Stuart's in Victory Lane, he goes, I got to thank people else for giving up his seat. And I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> So, but it was still, uh, I, don't, I don't know if really it's a goal of mine now to run a 360 sprint car or anything in any, in any more races. But, you know, I still, you know, do enjoy getting behind the wheel. I, you know, I, I, even though it's recreation, I go down to RPM and get into go-karts there. And, you know, we race go-karts at, uh, uh, you know, it's funny, we went to Chili Bowl last year and they have an indoor kart thing that's really nice out there in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. And it's road course and all this and all that. And it's all timed. Well, we, we paid for three races out there, and, uh, you know, I'm with a bunch of different guys that actually race and stuff like that, and the first two races I set the fast time, and they're all looking at me like, what the heck? These right. guys I've had race. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, yeah, the first the first two times we went out there, I set fast time. So That's cool. Um, yeah, so I, I've always enjoyed it. Maybe, you know, I wish I, you know, look back a little bit. I wish I had the finances or, or whatever, or maybe I should have got smart and tried to, get some sponsors and put something together where I could have raced, but you know, those times are gone now. So, sure. but, um, you know, but yeah, that's, uh, I'll throw that up, uh, you know, that sprint car there with me in it, you know, every now and then, cause it's one of the, you know, it's one of the greatest days of my life. I mean, you know, it, here I am running a car once and, and you now I look at these people running a hundred times and like, you know, I, I still look up to them. You know, I look mm -hmm. up to them as good as they are because I've done it, you know, I've done it once and I have a lot of respect for them. It's not an easy thing. Otherwise, everybody would have one, right? <laughs> you boy, you ain't kidding about that. <laughs> not, not saying that I was even that good at it, but it's just, it, it, you know, I always said that everyone should get behind the wheel once just to know what these guys do. And, and, and I mean, on up to, you know, Kyle Larson who and Christopher Bell, who we all think might be the best two drivers in, in the world now. Um, mm -hmm. I'm down to your local street stock guys. I mean, these people are good. You know, they're good talents. And they have to be because it's a much deeper. It seems to be at different junctures. It seems to be a deeper pool than it used to be. Oh, I agree. Oh, I do. I, I I totally agree with that. I think 
you know, the, just because they're running a street stock or a four cylinder or anything doesn't mean they're not good. They're probably just doing it because they don't have the financial whereabouts to, to run an upper division. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, it doesn't mean they're not talented, you know. Absolutely. Well, I figured when I was talking to you earlier this afternoon that we would be squeezing a half hour in, and here we've already been chatting for an hour. Um, is there anything that we missed at this point? Uh, got a new cat. <laughs> buddy too, right? Yep, yeah, buddy too. Yep, he's, he's actually on the couch with me looking at me like, when is he going to shut up? <laughs> I, saw, <laughs> I saw the photo updates uh, letting us know what yeah, Buddy 2 was no, up to. You know, I've always been known to talk a lot, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you got a hold of me because I, uh, you know, I actually do miss coming out to the studio, and those were some good times, and, you know, and, uh, and you know, we always talked about, you know, uh, rest in peace. We talk about the shows with Johnny Podalik and, and a lot of the other people that, uh, you know, uh, when oh. Justin Henderson used to come into the studio, and you know there were a lot of fun times when me and Mal used to come out together. And, and I tell you what, you've had the best. I mean, you, you've had Tony Stewart on your show. You've had Rico. I mean, you've you've done well. You it's, know, it, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Um, you know, uh, it's funny that you mentioned um, the episode with Johnny Podolik. That lost episode that, that nothing recorded, nothing worked, but it happened. We were there. Um, we all uh, lived it. The the night that Mike McLaughlin's mom stepped in front of the camera and blocked it while we had him on the phone, and that was the same night that we had. Uh, the, yeah, we had Bobby Ellison on the phone. Fo- I just wish some of I, well, who who would have thought? I I just wish we actually put our phones on and recorded it or something, you know. Yep. Um, but uh, what a night! I mean, it was it's still a special night. I, I know it's, and we wish uh, everyone wished that it, it turned out, but it was still. You know, there was a lot of people there, though, that got to enjoy that night. You know, it was a special night. There know, was, so that, was, that, was, that was fun. There were so many people there that took that night in that I don't think it matters if it was ever recorded or not. No, I mean, it was, I mean, we had them 10 deep, and that show was two hours. At least. Yeah, we were on for yeah, what? And, and they were, and they wouldn't, they, they, they were just glued. I mean, they might leave to go to the bathroom or go up to the bar and get another one or, or help us get another one. Right. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it was just, you know, it was one of those days that you're always going to remember, you know. It, it was that good. I mean, I, I still, uh matter of fact, one of my profile pictures is me wearing those headphones that Jay Fish took. Right. You know, right. Uh, uh, of that, because it was just such a special night. The the note sheet that Amy gave me with all the phone numbers on it, then the weeks leading up to it, I just found that slip of paper. Oh, really? Yeah, it was still kicking around. Yeah. Um, the studio that we're in now is the top floor of the old school near the library in Seneca Falls, and we have a complete setup that has four individual stations plus an extra TV. There's a couch on the side that we can run some other remotes to that if ever we wanted to do something like that again, I know Amy would be into it. I know we've got the technology improved so that we could pull it off there, and if we ever wanted to have that that get-together show where everybody comes out here to the studio in Seneca Falls – We've got the facility to support that as well. So, I mean, there's, I, I know we haven't been in, in, in regular and great touch um, since we made the move and everybody sort of went their own, their own ways. Um, but we've made a lot of upgrades here. And then my equipment at home, we've done a lot of upgrades with that too. So a lot of those things that we've always talked about doing, we've still got the ability to do. You mean you don't have to go down three floors to get a soda anywhere? Um, I can't promise that. Uh, that I can't promise. <laughs> There's no vending machines on the top floor. <laughs> you only have to go down one floor. It's uh, th- I think the DDSO downstairs has the has a vending machine. So so it's only one floor versus versus three or four. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, you know, but that's that's what makes things uh, you know exciting and fun when you you look back and you you know you're always going to look back and say the good old days. I mean that's always mm-hmm. it, it's sometimes it's a cliche or whatever, but. You know, you always sit back and say, oh, you remember, you know, we were talking the other day. I think it was, uh, we were down to Trenton. I was with Neil Wilt, and we were talking about going to different racetracks. And, and people can't comprehend how you went to races back then, not knowing what the weather was going to right. be. And you pull over on the side of the road and put $2.50 worth of quarters in, the, in a payphone to hear a freaking machine. 
<laughs> and the machine will say, oh, it's sunny and 90, and you're looking like there's nothing but clouds down, you know, where I'm going. But yet you're still trucked on. And right. you might have drove three and a half hours to find the gates closed. You know? <laughs> I mean, but we now we, we talked about that because I remember I used to do that, you know, every March and April before everything got to, to get going here in upstate New York, mm -hmm. I would always go down to Williams Grove. You know, the big thing was you go down, actually the big thing was you go down to Students Grove Saturday afternoon, Port Royal Saturday night, and then you stay over and go to Williams Grove on Sunday. But you would just leave and go, not knowing what the weather's going to be. Right. You know, and it's just... And, uh, you know, we got talking about track chasing, and I said my number one track that's always a thorn in my side that I never got to that shut down was East Windsor. And mm -hmm. I drove to East Windsor four times oh, no. to see the gates <laughs> closed when I got there. Right. All four <laughs> times. And everyone goes, how could you go all the way down there? And I said, there was nothing you can do. There was no map to pull up on a cell phone. There was no map. We all had, if we even had a cell phone, it was a flip. Or we pull over on a payphone, but there was a couple of nights where the weather was good. It was nice. Yeah, it was a little bit chilly. Come to find out when I got down there, they they canceled because they thought the night was going to be too cold. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, welcome, you know. So now, you know, we kind of take everything for granted. But that's that's how you did it back in the eighties. You know, and, and the eighties aren't really that far along. You know, it's right. not that far. How how far was we talk about? You know. So you'll talk about that first studio, you know, back when you're, you know, getting your polar, you getting your uh, media awards and everything else and say, Hey, remember that studio there? And, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what makes things fun. Yeah. You know, that's what makes everything fun. One of our first guests there, I'll, I'll never forget it. One of our first guests on the 31st lap was Tucker Hibbert of, yeah. uh, of snowmobile fame. And, and at super dirt week one time we had uh, Robbie Knievel on as a guest, which I mean, we never expected any of those things to come to pass, but, but they did. We've been we've been as as to take your turn from earlier, uh, religious or otherwise. Uh, we've been very blessed and very fortunate on on thirty first lap to make it two hundred and forty eight and creeping towards two hundred and fifty episodes. And and that doesn't include I don't think that includes all the at large stuff. I mean, we've been live for a bunch of different racetracks. Well, the the, the live ones is the one I I remember that. Oh God, what was a Super Dirt Week Outlaw Race and Rolling Wheels, and yep. I was probably nine beers in, running into the pits, grabbing all these drivers for you guys. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was grabbing, I grabbed gravel and Kemina, and you know, and I can't forget who else I was. Going. I was like, you know. It, that was a lot of fun. It was. Like, <laughs> I remember you on the air. Well, Dean's got another driver for us. And I was just <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, it, some of the, uh, the live shows was a lot of fun as well. Yep. You know, we, we, did just, a, uh, we did a live show at Utica yeah. Rome that was fun during. Uh, yes, think, we did in that gazebo. Yeah. yeah that was. Yeah. Jay Fish got some great photos that night. That was really cool. Yeah, no. And, uh, you know, if you're doing us, we go again. I'm going to try to get on this year if I can. Uh, we're going to be doing well. I mean, if, if if you have anything to say about it, I'm I'm pretty confident that we want to. Oh no, we uh, yeah no that was uh, um, I know I was uh, in the discussion because we do uh, conference calls during the week and stuff about that, and that was definite uh, a plus that we wanted as far as WRG and their car. I mean, that was definite because uh, it, it just brings the whole event to a new level, and uh, no, that's. Uh, plan on that i can guarantee you that and then hopefully there's ways that we can even make it better but i uh i wound up watching the shows afterwards and uh you know when what what that what, what uh when you had peter Britton there and the wind started taking everything away oh the camera fell backwards wasn't it yeah yeah that's yeah. what happened yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i remember you getting on he goes well this is a first <laughs> I mean, but that's what makes a great show but that was that show that you had uh post uh uh, 200 was an awesome, that was an awesome show. You guys did a great job with that. Nice. You know, it was, uh, uh, you got the emotions and you got the, the happiness and the sorrow, but you know, you could tell they actually enjoyed being on and, and that was cool. You know, it's always good. The, um, that was part of the packages when we would go and we've done this all over the country, you know, Utah, Minnesota, Virginia, Florida, Kentucky, Kansas was was we would do a pre show that set up the live stream and and it always it it always it always worked with the demolition derby stuff and and Mike sort of had the idea I'm like I've done this a million times it shouldn't be it shouldn't be too awful hard you know Mike and I have done it a bunch of different times at Syracuse and different racetracks how how hard can it be and well, what if we did it after the race just push this button and you should be good to go and walk through it and 
everything was good. And I, and it was really, really nice to be back at super dirt week. Um, it was nice to be part of the functioning media core at super dirt week and, and, and be back inside that fold. It was, and, and, you know, that's led to some other conversations with Mike about doing some other stuff. I'm, I'm looking forward to this year, uh, in terms of the racing side of things, a lot more than I have probably in the last several. I, I think there's a lot of good stuff to come. Well, that's good. That's good. I mean, you've been you've been involved with the sport one way or another for a long, long time, and, and uh, you know, and again, you're 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 not doing it for the money because I know how much you're paying yourself on this. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it, but you know, it just shows how much uh, dedication that you have, and, and there's still a lot of good people in the sport that that have that dedication, and 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 we, you know, it's what keeps it going, and hopefully, we can. Uh, entice some of the new generation to maybe uh join us you know because we're we're not going to be around forever and and uh you know we like to see hopefully the sport continue on after us i mean not like we're in the grave yet but you know i mean it's uh, times change and life changes and stuff and you like to see some of the you know younger blood come on in and, and help out and enjoy this sport you know sure. um, because it's, it's sometimes you think it's getting fewer and far between with uh, people that do want to dedicate that but well see what we can do absolutely well uh so what do you think should we should we try to do this again here in a couple of weeks after you get I back think, after uh, you get back from you know, florida you know, why don't we uh see if i can get on after florida and we'll do yeah, like a florida recap that's 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 basically what i was targeting yeah no I, i'd love to yeah all right that uh that sounds great we'll we'll earmark that and and I send you a couple of messages again, looking for for some other contact information for folks for the next two weeks. But um, I'll I'll follow up with you that on that stuff uh, in the coming days. No, please do, and then uh, yeah, I'll look at my phone uh, when I get done here. I didn't want to put it on speaker because I know that doesn't sound good. No sweat. Um, over to you. So I uh, I'll uh, I'll take a look and see what you sent, and I'll I'll send you anything that uh, that I have. Absolutely. Well, that that. Uh that sounds great. I do appreciate it. Dean, always great to have you on. I do appreciate you coming on and making some time for us tonight. And congratulations on, on all the improvements and the upgrades. And, and it is always good to hear that you're staying busy. I appreciate it, Chris. And, and thanks for reaching out when I, uh, when I saw the text and of course they didn't answer you in three hours, but, uh, um, I was, when I saw that, I said, Oh God, that's so cool. I want to, I want to get back on the show just to, uh, you know, we lose some times. So I appreciate it, man. Thanks. <laughs> you bet. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Chris. Take care, man. Thanks a lot. We'll see you. There goes Dean Reynolds, formerly, formerly, uh, formerly the director of series and sanctioning with Dirt Car Northeast. Always good to have him on the show recapping his changes uh, with everything that's been going on in his world, uh, with his new position, with the scheduling, with everything that he's got planned as he gets ready to go to the uh, – Northeast Motorsports Press Association events and, and then Motorsports Expo in Oaks, PA before making his way down to Florida for, I think he said, 16 days. Not too bad. I think that is a good point to stop this evening here on the 31st lap. So episode number 248 in the books coming to you from the North Park building here at Academy Square. We appreciate everybody tuning in and hanging out with us for a little while. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, let us know what you thought. Give us some feedback. Hit the like button. Hit the share button as well if you would. We do appreciate it. And we will see you all again in two weeks. Next week is going to be the final round drag racing podcast on Motorsports Thursdays. And then we will be back after that on um, the, the following week from that with another episode of the 31st lap. We'll see you then.